partners. And also, um, I'm going to introduce shortly uh, the future of uh, Health Knowledge Action Network, which Anne's going to talk about. So this is a, a co-shared uh, webinar with them. Here we go. So, um, <laughs> Amy Twain. So there are going to be some gremlins because it's the first time we've done it. Um, welcome everyone who's listening online. Um, if you have any questions online uh, and you want to do anything, have your questions, please send them in. And Francis will, uh, uh, Fran, Francesca will deal with them. Uh, uh, so we've got a set of talks, um, quite you know short talks to get to get the topic started. Um, um, I need to tell you two things, and we're going to keep to time, so we'll finish at 6.30. Two things I need to tell you. Number one, please turn your mobiles off. And number two, if there's a fire, that's the door. There we go. <laughs> uh, and then make your way out carefully, obviously. Um, follow the rules. Um, so we're going to start with a very quick uh, introduction from uh, Professor Sir Andy Haynes, who's going to talk to us about the future of... Thank you, Alan. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here on behalf of Future Earth. Future Earth is a global scientific collaboration that brings together scientists from a whole range of different disciplines to ta tackle really some of the, the salient uh, global environmental and development issues of our age. It has long historical roots, which I don't have time to go into, but you can see on the Future Earth website. But it's also reaching out into the scientific community through something called Knowledge Action Networks. And the idea of the Knowledge Action Networks is to bring together many of the stakeholders that can use research evidence together with the research community. And the Knowledge Action Networks aim to tackle eight uh, major challenges, such as delivering water, energy and food for all, decarbonizing the world economy, safeguarding essential natural systems. And one of the challenges is about sustaining human health in the face of these global environmental uh, challenges and changes that are occurring um, over and are going to become much more manifest over coming decades. So the Knowledge Action Network on Health will be launched over the, this year, probably towards the end of the year. And this is the first in a series of events which are outward facing uh, public events which are going to be really reaching out into the global health community and linking them with uh, researchers in a whole range of different disciplines. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. And I'll hand back to Alan to introduce the first speaker. Thanks very much, Andy. So I'm really pleased to be introducing uh, Edward Joy uh, to give the first talk, which is on some of the work that we're doing in India. A lot of the work that, um, that we do in the nutrition group here at the school is funded by the Wellcome Trust. Welcome Trust has a fantastic scheme called Our Planet, Our Health, which provides support to a large number in our team and uh, some really interesting projects. Um, and Edward is going to give the first talk uh, on sustainable and healthy diet in India. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Andy. Thanks very much, Anand. And uh, thank you, Fran, for putting this together. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks, everyone, for joining online. Um, let's see how these slides go. So I'm going to talk to you about sustainable and healthy diets in India, the project that I'm working on here at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So this is the challenge that we've set ourselves. We're looking at water and we're looking at food systems in India. So we're noting that in, in the context of India, we're seeing droughts, we're seeing uh, expected increased frequency of droughts um, over time. And we're also seeing long-term declines in freshwater availability. Um, and groundwater depletion. And this is, uh, we're setting this challenge and we're looking at the challenges this poses to the food system and to delivering healthy diets in India. Yeah. So if we look at where these problems are occurring in India, the areas, uh, the red hatched areas here, um, are where we see a long-term decline in groundwater availability. Um, and what we see in these areas is that there's intensive double cropping going on. So there's two cereal crops being grown every year, wheat and rice. And this is reliant on irrigation. So here we see a wheat field being irrigated, for example, in the Indo-Gangetic Basin, which is north northeast India. 
Um, and this, this production system is incredibly important in India. It's a massive net production area with food from there going right round India to feed the country. Um, and what we see if we look at groundwater levels in the, in the Gangetic Basin is since the 1970s, these have been declining quite rapidly and quite consistently. But actually, it's quite interesting to, if we take a long perspective right back to the start of the 19th century, sorry, 20th century, is that we find actually for a long time the groundwater levels were rising. And that's because as the canal irrigation, irrigation infrastructure increased, a lot of water was seeping through the bottoms of the canal and, and actually recharging the groundwater. But nonetheless, even though these levels we see today are not unprecedented, it is still a problem. The, the water is still declining, it's still getting harder to extract water, you have to go deeper, and it costs more to, to install all the pump infrastructure to bring this water up for irrigation. So that's, that's the sort of present day challenge that's facing the production systems in India. But of course, we've got future challenges as well. So currently, India is feeding about 1.3 billion people. But by the middle of this century, that's going to be more like 1.8 billion. But not only is population increasing, diets are also changing. So if we look relative to the 1970s, already sugar consumption has tripled per person. And milk con consumption has gone up by about 2.5 fold. So these increases are going to carry on occurring as more and more people live in urban areas, people's incomes increase and they aspire to consume these foods. And this is going to present a problem for water. And if we look just at the water that's going to be required for sugar, for irrigating sugar, we're looking at an increase from 33 to 44 billion cubic meters of fresh water every year. And that's going to represent about 10% of the fresh water available for irrigation in India by 2030. But of course, when we look at sugar consumption, we're also interested in health. And if we look already, India is home to the largest population of diabetics out of any country in the world. And by 2030, we are expected to see 69 million cases of diabetes in India. So this is a problem to do with water. It's also a problem to do with health. So in the SADI project, in the Sustainable and Healthy Diets in India project, we're taking a food systems perspective. And we're looking at what aspects can you shape along the food system to make sure that the diets are healthy, but also we can produce them with the natural resource constraints that we face. So we're looking up at this end, what can you shift about consumption? How can you shift dietary patterns to make them healthier and more sustainable? And we're looking down at this end, at the production side, what, what can you change at that end of the food system? So progress to date, so far we've, what we've done is we've taken a large dietary survey that was available with individual level dietary data. We've identified distinct patterns within that data. And the reason that this is really important is because India is a massive country with really diverse diets. So we don't want to talk about a national diet if it is not really relevant. We want to look at the dis distinct dietary patterns within the country and use those as, that, as our units of analysis. What we've also done is uh, a large study con conducted, um, led by our colleagues in the University of Aberdeen, looking at the greenhouse gas emissions associated with food production in, in India. And that's just been published. Um, a study being led by Fran, which has just been submitted, looking at the, the water footprints associated with diets in India. So that's uh, effectively how much irrigation water and how much precipitation water does it require to produce these typical diets in India. And of course, bringing this all together, so this is a study being led by our colleague Rosie Green, to bring, bring together the dietary patterns data and the environmental impacts data. And this is just giving two examples of the dietary patterns that came out and the associated environmental impacts. So one of these dietary patterns came out as a rice-based diet with very little dietary diversity, consumed mainly by poorer people living in rural areas. And we see that it takes it, it, these diets uh, lead to around about four kilograms of CO2 emissions per capita per day. There's about 566 liters of, of irrigation water required per person per day to produce these diets about over 2,000 litres of precipitation water required and about 0.21 hectares per capita per year to produce these diets. But if we look at another one of the distinct patterns here, which was a rice-based diet with some meat, more meat than the average in this large dietary survey that we looked at, 
we see that the greenhouse gas emissions are 15% 15 higher per person. The irrigation water requirements, 19% higher. Precipitation water requirements, 24% higher. And the land requirements, 24% higher. So you already you can see that if everybody was eating this rice and meat diet, that's going to lead to a much larger environmental impact than if everybody was eating this rice, low dietary diversity, rice-based diet. Now, of course, we're not saying we want everybody to stick there, because we'll see nutrient deficiencies, particularly micronutrient deficiencies, occurring in that population. So we want to see how we can shape the consumption to make it more sustainable and more healthy. And critically, we're looking for co-benefits. So this is where, as you change things, you can see multiple benefits occurring across different dimensions. So if we look and just take a very simple example of reducing sugar consumption and replacing with fruit and vegetable consumption. We can, we can see immediate health benefits occurring, but we can also see longer term benefits for the environment, so reduce irrigation water requirements, for example. And this is just to flag some really nice work that's being done by Lucas Alexandrovich, who's a PhD student uh, nearing completion of his PhD studies here at LSHTM. Um, he's did, done a really nice study looking at, uh, uh, it's a, a systematic literature review of all the studies uh, that have modelled the impacts of shifting from current dietary patterns to a proposed more sustainable dietary pattern. And he's looked at the impacts on greenhouse gas emissions, water footprints and land use. Most of these studies have been conducted in high income countries. So the India context is going to be different. But one of the really interesting things he's found is if we take patterns such as a vegan pattern, there's various vegetarian patterns, pescatarian patterns, or meat partially replaced by dairy, for example, is the least kind of significant change. You do see pretty significant reductions achievable in greenhouse gas emissions. Across all the studies, a median of 22% savings. But not just in greenhouse gas emissions. You also see an 18% savings in the water footprint, so the water resources required to produce these sustainable dietary patterns. And a 28% saving in the land required. So you see multiple benefits across different indicators, across different dimensions of sustainability. Also importantly, where the studies measured the health impact, they were almost always uh, tended to be positive. And they looked particularly at NCDs, non-food food feeders. So we're coming back to our SADI project, we know it's a different context. The, the, the baseline diets you see in India are very dis different to these high-income countries that have typically been studied. But what we're finding is as we use a an optimization tool to try and reduce the, the water use, the irrigation water use in producing diet, we do see that we can actually deliver health benefits alongside this. So just to take an example of one of the diseases we're actually able to model, we can see that as we reduce water requirements by 20% uh, by 2030, we can see a significant savings in the number of uh, lives lost to stroke and to cancers, and we can look at other NCDs including diabetes um, and uh, coronary heart disease. So this is a study that's in preparation these data are not data are not final, but again it is showing that there are potential co-benefits across health and environment. And of course, as I said, we're not just looking at a consumption perspective, we're also looking at elsewhere in the food system, what can you shift and how can you deliver more sustainable and healthy diets. And here this is a picture I took in India in um, in March last year, and we see a wheat crop uh, being grown at a government research station. The difference between this side of the path on the left and on the right is simply in the uh, agronomic technique uh, and the tillage practices that have been used there for the last six seasons. So on the left of the path, you see the wheat crop has been really heavily damaged by unseasonal heavy rains during the dry season. You get massive lodging, and this led to a, a state uh, wise across Haryana state, a drop in yields of about 20% that year because of these unseasonal rains. You also see puddling there in the field, so the water is not infiltrating into the soil. On this side, the same treatment in terms of fertilizer, the same seed, but at the same time. But here they haven't plowed the field for six years. They've used conservation agriculture technique. And the result is a much better soil structure, much stronger roots for the wheat crop, and you, as you can see, resilient to these unseasonal heavy rains. And that's the sort of thing which is actually delivering a, a fantastic co-benefits because not only does it appear more resilient to these heavy rains, it also requires less irrigation. It requires less labor in terms of tillage, um, and it delivers uh, a, more, uh, a more resilient yield.
So we're looking for these co-benefits throughout the food system. So I'll just end there with a thanks to all our colleagues, and I'm going to pass over to Alan to introduce the next speaker. Um, and thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alan. So, a taste of the sort of work we do here, and, and the importance of thinking of across sectors, agriculture, nutrition, So I'm now going to put you uh, slightly put our and our lives in the hands of Fran, who's going to connect uh, Billy Karish. Um, Billy, can you hear us? Yes, I can just hear you. And uh, are you okay with hearing me? Can you hear me? I can hear you great, really. Oh. Go ahead. OK. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm going to zip through these fairly quickly, because unfortunately, I have to sign off at the top of the hour. Um, but I wanted to get into a subset of the discussion. Um, under Future Earth, we have uh, several groups. And uh, Sir Andy had mentioned the Health Con. Um, but we also have some core projects. And I'm involved as the lead on one core project that's called One Health. And we have a great group of people, scientists from around the world, working on this, with, uh, coming from it with many different disciplines and, and many different perspectives. Uh, but I just wanted to share one area that I've been working on in a very short version for you. Um, and that's about the drivers and that get into some of the infectious diseases and link that to wildlife. Um, and particularly with bushmeat, which I'll kind of end up with. But just to put it in context, these zoonotic diseases, um, we can sort of estimate about a billion human cases of illness every year uh, due to uh, zoonotic disease. Other people have re reported up to 2 billion. So it's a fairly significant issue. Um, and of course, these are all linked back to animals. And what we've seen over time um, is a rise in, a, in these uh, disease events emerging, it's in, particularly in the number of the new events, uh, but also their source, as you can see in the yellow bars, uh, more and more of that to wildlife over time. And I don't have time in to get into the economics, uh, but you probably do understand that these um, events are costing more and more money uh, every year. So we start to see numbers um, like in the billions of dollars for some of these events um, in the tens of billions of dollars. But when we look at them um, objectively and start to link in um, some of the underlying components or drivers or, or characteristics that we get really uh, evenly distributed around the world. In some places, geographically, are more prone to these events. And the types of characteristics that linked with that, or relative influence, are certainly linked back to um, human population and biodiversity, particularly mammal biodiversity for human diseases, but also land use change. So another way to kind of break this down, this came from Lizzie Lowe's work, um, is sort of like what is driving these disease events. And you can see at the top that almost half are about land use change and agricultural industry change. And of course, that pandemic spread around the world is that third category, international travel and commerce. Um, but I just thought it was appropriate because we're talking about food and health. And all of these things really kind of relate back to what we're doing for food. In the case of land use change, this is like pasture change, so how people, where they're um, converting land um, pre previously the forest or, pasture or grasslands into pasture land. And so we see a high level of coral with that and emerging diseases at a global scale. Of course, it's very different. So I don't want to overgeneralize and say all of these um, disease events and all these zoonotic diseases are caused by the same thing, but we really have to hone in on that. And I'll get a little more into that later. But it does let us do some in the medical profession, start to think about how do we target surveillance and prevention 
because not all of these diseases are created equally, um, and we can start to see that certain types of diseases come from certain type of human activities. So with land use change, we see more of the vector-borne diseases, which lets us know that if land use change, we're getting into the kind of the policy implications. If we are going to start talking about converting land to agricultural production, there's some things we can do ahead of time um, from the policy direction to reduce the risk of things like vector-borne diseases, whereas some of these other types of um, human behaviors or kind of human activities cause these diseases, expose us to different types of diseases where we can also put in intervention strategies. So if we think of food um, EID events, so we kind of look at that a little differently, a lot of them link to food industry change. And that human susceptibility is really about raise, the rise of um, two things, mostly HIV AIDS and immunosuppression, uh, but also with the medical profession changing, we have more transplants, uh, so people are, are purposely immunocompromised to, for medical procedures. Uh, some of our cancer therapies suppress immune response. So we're seeing some of this is driven by our own activity in the, in the human um, health profession there. So what are these? This is just a, a picture of uh, Ebola response. So while a number of these events are probably uh, few and far between, maybe three or five a year, they seem to have very, very big consequences uh, socially and economically. So I don't have to tell you about Ebola, uh, but it, you know, at its roots, Ebola can really be think, thought of as a foodborne disease. Um, I'm going to to run through this, this is a just one day in one market in in uh, in Southeast Asia, and I think the sound is going to blow you away. So I'll try and turn that down when I turn it on. Let's see if I can. Do this. I'll turn the sound. Um, these are dogs uh, for sale. The live dogs are underneath the table, and people come and pick them out. Uh, these are pigs in uh, fresh being slaughtered in a market. I might skip ahead a little just to save us some time if I can. I think some of you might be seeing this as fairly jumpy. Uh, we have live chickens, so there's this potential there for influenzas. We know that influenzas in the poultry uh, production systems are really linked to influenzas and endemics. There's more pork, of course, than influenzas. And you see on a regular day, people are exposing themselves and their children and their consumer clients and customers uh, to the potential risk of these zoonotic diseases. We're going to zip around a little more. I'll move it quickly here. As you can see, jumpy, uh, but bats uh, being sold at this particular market. It's quite a large volume. It's about 3,000 kilograms of uh, fruit bats being sold on a weekly basis. And this is just one of about 20 markets like this. And then these are uh, also for sale. So they are also in large volumes. But in this particular market, the bats are more, more common. And then there's some wildlife. There's a snake there. We don't see men diseases coming from a few. I just wanted to bring your attention at the scale of this going on on a daily and weekly basis. We have hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people of getting their food on on a daily basis kind of situation. If you turn to Central App, uh, what really kind of drives some of this is huge human encroachment into formerly areas that were very low, uh, had low populations before. So this is a logging camp in Central Africa. This one happens to be in Congo. Uh, the workers come in, maybe 3,000 workers, and they don't have added food sources, so typically what's provided to them is wildlife food sources. As you can see, that's a great the volume also is fairly large just for Central Africa alone. It's about one billion year of wild meat that's provided. Um, and as I mentioned before, these opportunities are the risk or the probability of getting an infectious disease from an animal. Um, the numbers are pretty low, but it's kind of overwhelmed by the numbers, the opportunities that exist. So if you were buying a lottery ticket, if you were a virus or a bacteria and you wanted to move from an animal to a person and it was like a lottery and you bought a billion lottery tickets every year, making that leap uh, successfully but from an animal to a person is pretty, it's pretty 
Very good. So this is really enough to show you, run through quickly a few slides. David Wilkie from W. looking at this for many years. Of course, we know hunting not, is nothing new. And in North America and in Europe, we seem to have a large amount of hunting without uh, really undue disease emergence. Uh, but things are kind of just changed in the way that's happening around the world. So as I mentioned before, in the Congo example, you had forests like this with a few people in that area. And these disease events probably did it, uh, but they didn't really move very far. But we have a change in that scale of activities of land use change. Um, and I'll get a little more into that again, but you can kind of see um, that we know what we're doing on Earth um, is really changing the dynamics. Now, in all fairness, it's very, like I mentioned before, it's not only by country by country, but we're careful about not generalizing. So when we like look at something like this is in, in just in Gabon alone, which is a very small country with not too many people, the difference between the capital city and the rural areas is pretty dramatic. Um, so when you start to think about intervention strategies or control, you really have to put that into a context. And of course, not all animals are equal risk. So we think about Ebola. Certainly, a lot of the early cases that's related to bats, um, but a lot of human cases come from eating infected primates that get sick or die. Uh, but those animals are a very low percentage of the diet. Um, so there's a lot of other choices that can provide that protein need uh, that are probably safer, and there's uh, some opportunities there. Um, and it's also people say we can't, you know, deal with the bushmeat issue because it's um, it's too economically important. Um, but when you look at who's eating it and who has money, um, that importance varies amongst those different groups. So once again, as we start to think about the wildlife trade, or more specifically, uh, wildlife for human consumption, we need to kind of pay attention to um, not just the broad cultural aspects, but really at a community level what the needs are. So this is from David, uh, kind of just throwing out what kind of policy options are possible and available. And once again, I want to just remind everybody, this is very specific uh, to a given location. And so as you work on these issues, um, we don't want to have a broad swath at a global scale. We really need to pay attention. And I think um, after me or the uh, following speaker, uh, Dr. Golden is going to go into this because there's a huge, some huge importance and benefits of having access to wild animal meat. And so once again, he'll give you some other examples where that kind of fits in. And it kind of, I just wanted to get you thinking about, um, once again, about getting away from these generalizations, but at the same time not um, forgetting about potential risk and trying to target interventions and target policy choices um, that are locally appropriate um, as well as globally important. And then, of course, this is all changing. So I just wanted one last slide on kind of the temporal aspect. So, as you start to think about working with a community or a given country, uh, remember we do have times of changing. So this is kind of a 2050 projection of a distribution of one zoonotic virus that's linked to bats um, and the potential for that virus to become established in new places in the, on the planet. So uh, we can't just work from a snapshot in time and say where are the highest risk areas. We all so we have to be thinking forward because as we drive climate change, as we drive agricultural development, um, the landscape changes in all of these places. So I'll just finish with that and thank you. So my name is Pauline Schubeck and I would like to show you the results of two um, uh, research projects or actually two components of a research project that we're currently um, uh, executing which is around the theme of environmental stressors, agriculture, nutrition and health and we have a specific focus on the role of, uh, of fruits and veg vegetables. So when we uh, look at the previous presentations and also um, what you've heard perhaps in the news and, and read in scientific articles is that um, a climate change by itself um, uh, has a direct link to population health, um, for example, through heat strokes. But also, and we've seen that in the previous presentation uh, from Edward, that it has an impact on, um, on agriculture. Uh, it can destroy harvests, it, uh, 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 it can uh, decrease them, and that can have an influence on malnutrition. But at the same time, also, our dietary choices 
a, a feedback into uh, climate change and can have a, an effect on health directly, for example, through obesity. Uh, and climate change by itself is also not a simple parameter to, to um, uh, define because we're talking about several different um, impacts such as the, um, uh, global warming, uh, precipitation patterns that are changing and also uh, CO2 emissions. So you see already that with this simple example it already becomes quite complicated. So what we try to do is find in the literature all kinds of different frameworks and put them together in one um, quite comprehensive uh, framework where we can actually study each of the links between uh, environmental change, agriculture, nutrition and population health. So here we see the framework that we um, came up with and actually the framework doesn't really have uh, a starting uh, point um, because everything links to everything and uh, all the grey arrows that you see in the, in the presentation, these are links that we would like to, tr uh, to find some evidence on in the literature and we've started um, uh, to find some of those, um, uh, those links and evidences in uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews and for some it's less, uh, it's less evident uh, yet. But let me talk you through this, uh, this framework, starting with the green box, the drivers of environmental change. With what will we take us another 15, 15 years? Um, but so to, to, to start with the drivers of environmental change, so here you have your actual climate change, uh, land quality, water quality, etc., etc., has a massive impact on. Uh, agriculture and all kinds of food uh, system activities. So in agriculture we distinguish uh, the actual productivity, the yield, but also the quality of, uh, of crops. Are they very nutritious? Uh, are, are, is there perhaps any toxic um, contamination on the, on the crops? And also um, uh, from the farm to the plate. So all the inputs that, uh, that we need in the agriculture, but also to, to process uh, all these foods um, um, uh, the consumption and, of course, the waste uh, from all three of these um, uh, these activities that are displayed here. Uh, and then we um, we say that um, government involvement and in research and development kind of have an impact on on all of these uh, these factors as they shape what we can do, what the restrictions are, what kind of new developments there are for new technologies to be applied, for example. And uh, on the background here in the grey box. We've got the social and economic so, uh, and societal uh, factors that uh, kind of shape our decisions and the, the way how we uh, how we uh, might decide about a diet or to decide what to, to crop as a as a farmer, depending on education, wealth distribution, etc. Et so that then all uh, leads to our uh, food and nutrition security in a certain area and also globally, um, which uh, if we uh, specifically look at uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, finally ends up uh, in a, a specific nutrient and energy intake from those fruits and vegetables and then we have to match that with the nutrient and energy intake from whatever the rest of our diet, diet uh, uh, comprise of, comprises of and that uh, we would like to translate in a diet relating burden of disease. So th this framework is actually uh, step one and uh, step two is then to, to actually model this. So finding evidence for each of those links, what kind of impact can we expect, what kind of magnitude are we talking about. We probably can't really pinpoint it down to one specific number, but at least we've got an idea of what sort of effect each of those um, uh, uh, parameters, uh, what kind of impact they have uh, on each other. So one of the, um, uh, the, the main uh, links between those drivers of environmental change and agriculture is actually quite uh, well studied if it comes to staple food. So there's been quite a few research, for example, this paper by Knox and, and colleagues where they looked at them, uh, I'll enlarge it a little bit for you, uh, at um, uh, climate change projections and anticipated yield change in all kinds of different staples, whereby the yellow one is maize and the, and the red one is the uh, it's all good. Um, so you, you see uh, the vast majority of all those studies which here are in southern Africa are, are predicting a, a, a very, uh, um, uh, yeah, quite a, quite a substantial uh, decrease in yield. And 
and also from a quality perspective, if you remember that we distinguish the quality and the quantity of the of the crops, there have been uh, quite some studies about the quality of staple crops here, for example, by um, by Sam Myers at all from Chris Golden's group, who will be speaking later, um, who looked at the uh, CO2 elevation specifically and the impact on uh, uh, zinc and iron uh, concentrations, for example, in uh, in uh, certain staple crops and legumes. Uh, but what we didn't fi uh, find a lot was how does this work for fruits and vegetables? And we know it's it's relatively a small uh, um, group uh, in all the food groups that we might consume, but it's very important from a nutritional point of view uh, because it does deliver uh, certain nutrients to our diet that might be difficult, especially in, in, in uh, um, less food secure areas that might not be found in other food groups. So, so they're really unique for bringing that to the uh, to the table. And here is some kind of list of, of things that you uh, you find often in fruits and vegetables. Uh, and also, we know from the Global Burden of Disease studies that low fruit and vegetable intake is highly associated with an increased morbidity and mortality, and that there is a direct link between income. So those that uh, spend a larger proportion of their uh, diet uh, sorry, of their income on uh, fruits and vegetables um, uh, logically eat less portions of fruits and vegetables per day. Um, uh, so um, what we wanted to do is, because they weren't really out there, is conduct two systematic reviews, uh, quite similar to the studies that I showed you before, but then specifically on, on fruits and vegetables. What is going to happen under different environmental uh, change scenarios with um, uh, fruit and vegetable yield and with fruit and vegetable nutritional uh, quality, for example, vitamin C content, etc., etc. Um, so I'll go through you. They, they haven't uh, uh, been finished yet, but I'll go through the highlights of the initial um, results that we found. So you see already, to start off with yield, you see already that the negative uh, uh, box is quite a bit larger than the positive uh, uh, box, and, and that's for a reason that most of the environmental change um, uh, effects are, are negative, are reducing yield rather than increasing, uh, with the uh, exception of CO2, uh, which seems to stimulate the growth of the plant, mostly the vegetative part, uh, part which is good for uh, crops like lettuce, for example, or spinach, uh, but sometimes also uh, the number and the size of the fruits of, so of certain crops. Um, and it might mitigate the, the negative effect of some of the other climate change or environmental change uh, barometers that influence the, the crops. Um, and we see that in temperate zones, uh, that there is actually a positive effect of, of most of the, or at least uh, uh, in the foreseeable future, uh, because it might increase the growing season, because there are more favorable circumstances for certain crops. Uh, it might decrease frost risks, etc. But uh, for most, we see negative uh, effects of, um, of climate change on crop yield. Um, uh, for example, if, uh, the increased temperatures can re uh, reduce the dry weight. Uh, it uh, can have an influence on the bud break uh, period in the winter. It can have an Im influence on pollinators, so uh, more an indirect link. Uh, and also water stress, salinity, increased uh, tropospheric ozone all have negative influences on yield and one study even found the combined impact of those uh, uh, found a, re a reduction of 64% uh, fruit weight in, in tomatoes. And of course climate shock events can completely destroy um, uh, yield. Um, but if we, oh sorry, so especially the subtropical and tropical zones uh, are experiencing this and this is something that is not something for the future but that we actually see now. Um, however, for crop quality, it's a little bit diff uh, different. First of all, it's a little bit less known what, the, what those uh, changes, uh, environmental changes do to crop quality. And also, it seems to be um, a bit depending on what the optimal range is. This is one of the um, uh, papers that we found in the systematic uh, review, very uh, interesting read, where they looked at each of those climate factors, what uh, index or quality index in the fruits and veg they are... Um, uh, they're having an impact on and what the optimal range is. And it seems to be uh, that it could be possible if it pushes a certain circumstance into this optimal range, but it will have a negative effect if you, you get pushed outside that upper uh, boundary and then you get a reduction in the quality of the fruit. But it seems overall to have much more positive influences than 
on the on the yield. But of course, we uh, we have to be very careful in that and see whether these advantages actually outweigh the the negative uh, the negative results that we just showed in the previous slides. And if we we should be very careful when we plan our mitigation or adaptation uh, strategies. So these are very briefly the uh, the, the main findings of the, that quality, uh, qualitative uh, systematic review. Sorry, the quality systematic review, where, where you see actually that that each of those parameters might have both positive and negative um, uh, effects. I won't go through through all of them, but interestingly. Uh, the CO2, which was the only positive factor in the yield, uh, actually we found only negative effects in terms of quality, where um, the rapid growth leads to decreased mineral uptake, something that was also um, uh, seen in the Myers paper that I, I showed before on the staple crops. And uh, also tropospheric ozone seems to uh, have mostly negative results. There were few but inconsistent results with that uh, tropospheric ozone can also increase the quality. Of, uh, of certain crops. So to uh, to end uh, with this uh, this slide, um, of course, uh, research uh, uh, finishing a part of the result, uh, research always uh, yields more questions, and uh, these are some of the questions that in the next year or so we really would like to have a look at and and, and try to to answer. So. First of all, if we now take into account all these positive and negative results together, um, which geographical areas will be hit first? W which areas are we talking about? And what role do fruits and vegetables play in these, especially in the ones that are hit first in their overall diet? Um, uh, one of the questions is also what would people do if a certain vegetable is not available? Would they just eat staple crops? Would they re uh, replace it for another vegetable? And what if then that first vegetable is put back on the market? Uh, would they stick to the one that they changed to, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, and ultimately, we would obviously like to to see if there are um, um, uh, nutrient deficiencies that that we could measure and and what the burden on NCDs would be there. Uh, but also in high income countries, will will there be an, an effect here? Will um, the increasing prices or the, uh, the or the decreased availability be noticeable here on the market, and, and might it affect perhaps the uh, the uh, the lower socioeconomic classes, even in the in the UK, um, and finally, of course, the the modelling would uh, would also give us much more uh, information on what, under certain climate uh, uh, scenarios, uh, the impact of these environmental changes through agriculture and nutrition might be on population health. And that was it. Oh, sorry. And these are all the people that I am. Um, Work with and a special thanks to Francis Bird who went through all the uh, the uh, quantity, the yield paper. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. I think it's important to two standout things for me there. One is that you know actually a lot of work has been done on agricultural yields uh, and the impact of climate on agricultural yields, but almost no work has been done on the consequences for that on health. And I think that's what this this group is. This work is really aiming to do look at the, the consequences for health of major environmental change, uh, and in our case, through agriculture, which is obviously critically important. And the second thing that sprung to mind uh, was how the consequences are going to differ for people in different in different countries and in different wealth uh, strata. And uh, I'm going to be fine, <laughs> but uh, you know, the two billion smallholder farmers in Africa and Asia, what are they going to do? So I think there are some really big issues that come out of this. Now, the great news is that Chris's slides are up, and if, if we have the magic combination of Chris's slides being up and Chris being online, we've almost <laughs> got something that, 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 that will approximate the seminar. Uh, so, uh, Chris, can you audio? Okay. Yep, uh, I think I'm good to go. I'm going to turn off my speakers as soon as you guys tell me to go so you guys aren't having feedback. Thank you. Ready to go? Am I, am I good to go? All right, so apologies in advance if this is a very kind of shallow dive. Fran had uh, told me to keep it to eight minutes, so this is a very quick run through on some of the research that I've been doing. And much of the focus is really looking at 
how the threat of wildlife declines will lead to changes in human nutrition and changes in food security in different places around the world. And much of my research has been centered in a case study where I have been embedded in Madagascar now for the past 17 years, <clears throat> but also on some new work that I've been doing looking at how global fishery declines will impact certain types of socio-ecological contexts in different countries around the world. And so all of this work is part of my post here at the School of Public Health at Harvard, but also part of the Planetary Health Alliance, where I serve as the associate director. So for those of you in the audience, we're having our uh, annual meeting at the end of April, and I would welcome you guys to email me if you'd like to hear more about it, but we would love to have you come and attend. All of this fits within this frame of how human health is affected by ecosystem alteration. And much of this is really with this understanding that middle class and wealthy individuals from different countries around the world will find ways through improvements in infrastructure and access to markets and engineering the environment around them to withstand the environmental impacts of changes to their to their ecosystem. And yet the poorer populations from around the world will really be disproportionately affected by a degradation of natural systems because they will lose access both to the ecosystem services, but not have the financial capital or the social network to withstand this kind of increasing burden of disease from environmental degradation. And so the two case studies that I'll present to you today, one looks at terrestrial wildlife declines, the other looks at fishery declines and how that will impact micronutrient nutrition in different places around the world. And so the environmental change we're looking at is wildlife population collapses and how that leads to reduced access to animal source foods, which then has an impact in reducing the amount of micronutrient and vitamin intakes within diets, which of course has consequent effects uh, on the burden of disease from the incidence of micronutrient deficiencies and uh, non-communicable diseases in terms of obesity, metabolic disease, et cetera. So to start, why are animal source foods important? And this is really a key piece of our argument. And in many developed countries around the world, uh, animal source foods might not be a critical part of the diet. We might have found ways to replace this with a diverse vegetarian diet, with supplements, with fortified foods and biofortified foods. And yet in many parts of the developing world, they are so, uh, in need of certain types of nutrients and they do not have access to markets they do not have access to fortified or biofortified foods and so animal source foods serve as this really key nutritional pathway to gain access to nutrients like iron vitamin b12 zinc uh, certain types of fatty acids and so whether it is livestock or fish or different types of wildlife each of these pieces of the diet serves a very critical role in delivering micronutrient nutrition. So where I've been working in Madagascar, which is in northeastern Madagascar, uh, wildlife consumption is incredibly prevalent. Uh, we see households that are uh, relatively low reliance on different types of fruit bats, but uh, more reliant on bush pigs and lemurs and different types of carnivores. And with more than 90% of the population in this area, who are eating tenrex, which are featured there, and they're kind of like a little hedgehog-like animal. Uh, so you can see that this is not some sort of small subset of the population that relies on wildlife for food, but it's really prevalent across different types of socioeconomic groups, uh, cultural diversity, geographical diversity, etc. And what we did over the past, uh, we did in a 15-month study in 2013 and 2014, was we enrolled 15, uh, 150 households in a 15 month study. And on a daily basis, they recorded the amount of food that they consumed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so you can see that in the kind of three col columns, Marena, Antoine, Dua, Riva. And so those three columns represent breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It mistakenly says kilograms in this version, but it's grams of different types of foods. And they recorded their diet at each meal and so we have this great resolution specific dietary data on what every household ate over the course of that time period. We then were able to make very rough assessments of what proportion of different types of foods were consisted in the average diet of households in this rainforested region of northeastern Madagascar. And as you can see, more than half of the diet by weight is rice. 
Madagascar is the largest uh, riza culture in the world. They eat more rice per person per day than any other place. Uh, and if you add in the kind of staples and bananas, so the plantains, yams, uh, sweet potatoes, cassava, taro, and rice, so all of these relatively nutrient poor staples, uh, that's about 75% of their diet. And the remaining quarter of their diet by weight is all of the things that really deliver important types of nutrition. And so when looking at the animal source foods specifically, you can see that the overwhelming majority is coming from bushmeat or insects or wild birds, and that some households are eating upwards of 70 kilograms of bushmeat in a year, uh, which is quite a lot of meat given the meat scarce uh, setting in which we live in this area of the country. And so from very early work that I did, we showed that there was a roughly 30% increase in the rates of anemia within the lowest income households who were unable to purchase animal source foods in compensation for losing access to wildlife. And so what this tied together was really this idea that as wildlife populations degraded, as the forest was degraded locally, people would lose access to these key food items. And in the absence of a market, they would be forced into vegetarian items and diets that would not deliver those same types of micronutrients. And now what we're currently analyzing is a study from this 15 month follow up where we not only have hemoglobin as an outcome, but we have iron, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin B12 and fatty acid profiles for this entire population. Uh, moving into the second study that I mentioned, we've been working on the grant that Peter, uh, sorry, that uh, Alan had mentioned on uh, the Wellcome Trust's Our Planet, Our Health, where we're looking at how global fishery declines will affect micronutrient undernutrition in different parts of the world. And as you can see, we have this very interdisciplinary team that ranges from epidemiologists to geographers to econometricians to climate scientists, uh, really interested in how changes to people's access to fish over time given certain types of climate synergies and unsustainable fishing scenarios will limit people's access to fish for food and how that will then lead to undernutrition and food insecurity in some areas and so using our kind of operational framework of certain types of pressures whether it's overfishing or sea temperature rise or pollution and how that will affect the state of the fisheries there will be certain types of human responses to that change over time, uh, whether it's people better protecting or better managing their fisheries through marine conservation or through quota systems or through no catch areas, whether the market responds by increasing prices of scarce species or whether there are technological innovations like aquaculture in certain areas of need. All of that will kind of take place over this iterative process over the next 50 years in terms of uh, minimizing or expanding on these certain types of pressures and the human response in relationship to the state of fisheries. And finally, how all of that process impacts a change in fish catch, a change in income derived from fish catch, and the synergy between those two, which is really nutrition between what you eat and what you make from what you catch. Uh, this work is heavily reliant on the Sea Around Us project which is based at the University of British Columbia, where Daniel Polly and Dirk Zeller have led a massive effort over the past 15 to 20 years to reconstruct fish catch along four different categories, artisanal fish catch, which just means kind of small scale uh, catch, subsistence, meaning that all of the food, all of the fish is caught for direct home consumption, industrial or commercial fish catch, and then finally recreational fish catch. And it also quantifies the discards, which is very often forgotten, so that we can better analyze the sustainability of fish harvests over time. And so what this database allows is this well over 50 year record of how different countries have changed their fish catch over time and what that catch might look like into the future, given trends that we know about how sea temperature rise will influence people's availability to fish. And so this uh, visual from Vicki Lam and William Chung, also at the University of British Columbia, shows how a certain type of fish species might have its very particular habitat niche with a certain type of temperature and pH setting. And as climate change occurs and that uh, habitat changes, the fish will want to migrate its distribution. And as it does so, 
it might move from one country to another country. And so what we tend to see is that different types of fish species will be moving away from the pole, away from the equator and toward the poles so that they can maintain the current temperature niche in which they're in. And so this overall global figure shows that exactly where in parts of the tropics along the equatorial belt, you can see in deep red, there's an anticipated 50% decline in catch potential for fish over time. And this is from the recent iteration of the IPCC. And so what strikes me as a public health nutrition specialist is that the very areas where we're anticipating the greatest and hugely significant declines in fish catch are also the ones that we are most concerned about in terms of food insecurity and malnutrition. And so what we did in a recent paper was to overlay these areas of rapid declines in catch potential and overlaid them where countries were very reliant on fish. And we calculated this reliance by looking at the uh, levels of nutrient supply in their country. So to what extent were countries uh, kind of on the threshold of micronutrient deficiencies were already nutrient deficient or were so uh, oversupplied with nutrients that a decline in fish wouldn't matter. And then also looked at the proportion of their animal source foods that were uh, composed of fish as compared to uh, other types of animal source foods. And through a triangulation of those, we were able to highlight certain hotspots. And so you can see that West and Central Africa and Southeast Asia really pop as countries that are incredibly vulnerable to these nutritional shifts and also most reliant on fish. And so are going to be very much at risk from these projected fish declines. And so what you can see here is that not all of the issues around people's losing access to fish is going to be driven by climate change. But what you see here uh, from the Global Fish Watch mapping is all of these lights that are blinking are commercial fishing vessels. And so what you can see here in Madagascar is all of the commercial fishing vessels that are taking out fish from the shore, very often not delivering those to local people, of course, but sending those out to international markets. And another thing that you will be able to see soon enough is that not all of the fish is really coming from a Madagascar based location and generating income from them, but there's quite a bit of fish poaching that happens. So from Réunion, which is a kind of French protectorate, you can see that there's a lot of fish poaching that happens within Madagascar's waters. That's of course shipped internationally with none of the benefits going to local people. So much of this kind of unsustainable fishing will have huge impacts uh, on the local developing world where they have very little ability to monitor uh, their own waters. Similarly, we can see what could be hopeful visions of how certain types of marine conservation could benefit local people. And so what you see in that central square, this is in Kiribati in the South Pacific, is all of this fishing that's occurring within that box and then how it rapidly uh, begins to disappear. And this is during the time where it became a marine protected area um, as gazetted by the former president of Kiribati. And so you can see this enormous value of creating marine protected areas and how that can actually protect source fish populations for vulnerable communities around the world. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has been a part of this work and everyone that has funded the work. And I would love to take any questions if uh, people are interested. Thank you very much, Chris. Right, it is. That was superb. Um, it is now 6.33. So we're three minutes over, and if you want to go, please go. Um, if we have um, five minutes for questions, however, if anyone would like to ask any questions. Uh, to anyone in the room, uh, uh, Billy's gone, but Chris is online. Um, if anybody would, like, anybody would like to ask questions, clarification, broader Oh, and anyone online who would like to, Francis is going to help. Hi there, I just wanted to say thank you. I really, really like the presentations. I'm interested to know um, what the experience has been of the research in terms of local buy-in for the joined up sort of sustainability and health message um, from a kind of policy and stakeholder perspective. Oh, is it, well, who's, that, who's that question for? Just in general. Well, I was going to say the 
All right, so actually it's a hugely important question. Because, um, if you're thinking about policies to change consumption patterns or agricultural practice or something, you have to base them within uh, accepted practices and, uh, and uh, behaviours. Uh, so I think there's two things to say. Number one is that we did some work on this in the UK to look at how you could change the UK diet to make it lower greenhouse gas emissions. And we were very, to make it have, uh, to be healthy and have lower greenhouse gas emissions. And we were very careful to ensure that the diets that we recommended uh, met, uh, were, were, were typical of existing diets. So we didn't move everyone to become a vegan, because that's clearly never going to happen. Uh, I say that, but I'll come back to it. Uh, 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 but, but we did move people slightly, and we showed that small, relatively small changes in diets can have major impacts on, on greenhouse gas emissions, can also, be, can also improve health outcomes. So we published that work uh, last year uh, in a couple of papers. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but the question is very real, because uh, you know, people don't, we always say people don't like to change their habits, and there's a policy resistance to these sorts of things. But actually, if we look forward 20 years, some of these changes are going to happen because they have to happen. Uh, and there's going to be very little choice. So people are going to have to adapt to these new environments, and they're going to make these changes, and they're going to make them quite rapidly. As the price of meat goes up, people are going to change their consumption patterns. If the availability of fruit and vegetable changes dramatically, we're going to change the fruits and vegetables that we eat, we eat here, and other people are eating in other countries. So I think some of the, the long-held concerns about the fact that you know, people don't like to change, and it's a difficult policy environment, that's absolutely true. But I also think that some of these changes are going to be so big that there's going to be very little option, and people are going to change, and countries are going to change. Um, you know, we work uh, in our work. We work. We try to work as much as possible with policymakers. We engage from a very early stage to talk through what the plans are, what their interests are, and how we're going to do the work, and then and then and then share the findings with them before any publication. So, you know, we do we we make that step. But I think, as I say, some of these these are going to, some of these decisions are going to be made by the by the changing world, not for policymakers to step up and make that decision. It might just be worth adding that there are now a couple of countries that have developed guidelines which yeah. incorporate sustainability: China and uh, Brazil. Uh, so they are kind of uh, like an early wave of, of uh, governments that are taking on this challenge. Now, how much they will be implementing, of course, is another question. But at least they've started developing those guidelines. Our own government was well, the UK government, the Public Health England, has the Eat Well plate, which now mentions the word sustainability twice. Uh, um, we, 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 we gave them our data just before they went to publish, and they rethought them what they were going to do. So we had a bit of an influence on it, but uh, it is, uh, it is uh, it's something they're definitely aware of. But uh, this is, uh, takes some time. I'll be honest, we'll be asking Chris about his experience in getting oh, the Eat Well. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Andy, I'm around for another minute if you want to chat, otherwise I have to jump off. I'm sorry. Um, for example, if you're looking at dietary patterns, and then you look at something like water availability, how do you know that the diet, dietary pattern that you've identified hasn't already responded to lower levels of water availability? And is that something, especially in urban areas, that people may have adapted already and the nutrition community has come to the <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I, I think, I think yes. I mean, to the extent that we see, I mean, you can look at a, at a really large scale. You see, rice consumption is widespread in southern India, and wheat consumption is widespread in northern India, and that is directly linked to the, the ability of the environment in those parts of the country to to grow those crops. So it's uh, much easier to grow rice in the south. Than, um, and wheat in the, the drier north. Um, so I think, yes, diets have already been shaped by things like water availability. It's definitely been shaped by environmental constraints um, and opportunities. Um, so I think it is an ongoing thing. Um, I think, having said that, I think what we see with diets, and when you combine dietary change with population growth, and put that together with the trends that we're seeing in water availability, I think we are seeing something that's going to be increasingly relevant um, so, and I'm talking about water shortages here, really. Um, so I think water will be an increasing constraint, effectively, on what uh, what you can produce domestically in India. Um, and 
probably therefore on prices and probably therefore on dietary choices. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned much today is international trade. So that's going to be really interesting to see if, if India can't meet its domestic requirements for its domestic production, is that then going to be just made up through international trade? Um, but uh, yes, I, I think you, you, you make a very good point that it is something that's already shaped diet. I think there's a lot of questions for anyone online about uh, changing agricultural practices in India and the comparability of, of those practices on uh, the broader questions on sustainability. And I think that's a really, really important question. And, and actually, uh, it's quite complicated to respond to. But I think one thing I would say is that it's estimated that by 2050, 80% of the world's population will be living in cities. Now, if 80% of the world's population is living in cities, and they all need to eat something, the remaining 50% are going to be working really hard to produce that food. So uh, there are real, I couldn't agree with you, and I don't think this is being thought through. We think, oh, it's development, and we'll all move to cities, and we're going to starve, and it's going to be the next thing. But actually, we still need to eat. And there is, there's emerging evidence, in fact, that people who are migrating to cities in several of the lower income countries are finding it really difficult to cope with those cities and are moving back. Yeah? And I wonder, I wonder how good those projections are that 80% of the world is going to be living in cities by 2050. Because it's really unclear what exactly they're going to do. You know, there are real issues around the availability of production and all of these things. And as the environment gets tougher, as we're doing some work on uh, heat stress uh, and increasing temperatures, so as it becomes incredibly hot in some countries to work, people just can't work, can't do the labor, can't produce the crops, so they won't be available for consumption, and they won't be available in cities either. So I agree, there are some big, big issues coming up. And what we're hoping is that this, this is stimulated in you, it's been thought about, you know, what are those issues, what are the linkages? But also, we're very keen that people move themselves out of their MSCs, out of their little silos, and think much more broadly about the big issues of our as you've seen, you know, all the way from fisheries to to to, to modelling of, of health benefits and potential fruits and vegetables, you know, these issues are very big and very cross-sectional and need to be thought through by the teams of people working in different sectors. So um, I hope, I think we can end there, Fran. I think, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for all of you who stayed online. Apologies again for any the gremlins between our first run-through. I hope you found it of interest and, uh, and hope to see you again. Thank you very much.